the way to really experience this material is to see it in person. So we encourage you to come to Letter Form Archive and also to come to uh, the Book Arts Department here. Um, so uh, as you can see, we've already been taking that advice. Um, what you see here is from last Saturday, the extended program in of Type at Cooper West came for a field trip to uh, special collections here. Um, they're looking at a rubbing of the Trajan inscription on the table, uh, which was done by Father Edward Kaddish. And uh, on the right, you can see a detail of that rubbing. Um, you wanna? So, um, very happy to be here with you um, and kick off this lecture series. And um, <clears throat> this will go on um, not only this spring, but continuing on in the summer and next fall, and we hope for a long time after that. Um, we have had a similar lecture series through uh, Type at Cooper at Cooper Union in New York. It's been very successful, and um, uh, I think it's been going for about five years now. <clears throat> um, so we're, we're going to walk you through some of what, for Rob and myself, are the highlights of uh, both the collection at the Letterform Archive and the collections here at the San Francisco Public Library. <clears throat> um, this uh, turned out to be, the, the idea seemed good, but then when we actually got down to trying to choose things, we found, of course, that <laughs> we like too many things. Um, so th this is really a, a very um, sort of sparse overview of things, and uh, some of them are chosen because we have personal connections to them in various ways. And interestingly enough, as we have prepared this thing, especially with the cooperation of the library, we found even more connections that we didn't know about to begin with. So um, you'll hear about some of those as we go along. Uh, we're going to start um, with the Trajan inscription, uh, with this rubbing done by Father Edward Kadich. Uh, was donated to the library by uh, Don Moy. Um, the rubbing was done in 1973. Kadich actually made a number of trips to Rome to do these rubbings. And he is responsible for two books on the Trajan inscription. Um, uh, and and he, he did really a, a, a minute, an examination of the inscription in minute detail. These are from the first book uh, that he published. And Kadich was a, a truly a Renaissance person. He, um, not only did he figure out how these letter forms were made on the inscription, which nobody really had figured out since the time they were actually made. Uh, he learned how to write them with a brush, how to cut them in stone. He then proceeded to um, uh, do all the production of his own books. Uh, these are tracings made from <coughs> one of these rubbings. <coughs> of uh, their tracings of every letter on the inscription. <clears throat> and um, Kadich's theory about the way these letter forms were made uh, was rather revolutionary. That is, nobody had really understood them before. <clears throat> he recognized, because he was trained as a young man to be a sign painter and show card writer, that these letter forms were originally written with a brush before they had been chiseled in stone. And it, it, it's enormously convincing the way he has reproduced them with the brush. <clears throat> um, this upset um, a number of people. Uh, primarily, well, it upset uh, almost everyone in Britain who was concerned with typography and lettering because they didn't know this to begin with, and had other sort of half-baked theories about the way these things were made. Uh, but over the years now, um, I, I would say most of them that I know anyway have become 
um, converts that the, it's, it's rather undeniable that this is actually the way they were made. Um, <clears throat> so um, seeing this uh, uh, rubbing is um, a magnificent experience. I have to say, it, um, every time I bring classes to, and I did this in New York for the last four years, bring people to libraries to see original work, um, it, it has a kind of a magical effect where you you experience something in a way that you you cannot do when it's on screen or when there's an image of it printed with half tone dots in a book. Um, and um, Rob was saying when we saw this rubbing on Saturday that every time he sees it, it, it renews his this kind of experience. And I have to say. I have exactly the same reaction. It's it's, um, it's so I, I think ultimately that's the reason why we do what we do is that these things do have a certain magic to them, and when you see the original things, uh, that is uh, that that tends to to evoke it. So th there is a good reason for preserving these pieces of paper uh, that we have here at the library and at the Letterform Archive. Uh, and it is wonderful to have access to these things online and so on, but I, I have to say from my own experience with not only myself, but with students, in the flesh is different. <laughs> so let me just talk about this yeah. a bit before he moves on. You, you missed the part about your teacher. So. What's on the left here is a photograph of Kaddish with Lloyd Reynolds, who was the calligraphy teacher at Reed College in Portland, Sumner's teacher at Reed College in Portland. So that's one more personal connection. The letter here is um, from Alfred, um, sorry, from Lloyd Reynolds to Alfred Fairbank, the, the British um, calligrapher and scholar, presenting a copy of the of the Kaddish book, uh, the first Kaddish book, the uh, Trajan inscription in Rome with the tracings and the photographs. And this is in the letter form archive. Uh, we have Alfred Fairbank's copy of the book. Um, and this is Fairbank's reply. Now, both of these letters are in the, the um, pop-up exhibit in the back. And uh, you can't see the back of the Fairbank letter, but the juicy bits are on the front. And uh, Basically, he would have normally written a, a, a handwritten letter. Um, that's what he always did, and, and he did many times to Lloyd and his other correspondents. But he says in the beginning of this, I've typed this letter because I want to keep a record. And he, he goes on to explain why Kaddish is all wrong. Um, and it's interesting because the first book, uh, which came out in about 1960, uh, The Trajan Inscription in Rome, had very detailed studies of the inscription, drawings and photographs, and a little book which um, kind of suggested his theory that they might have been brush written, but didn't have the full logical theoretical presentation of that, which came later in the second book called Origin of the Seraph in 1967. So I've always wondered whether Fairbank changed his mind when he actually saw Origin, uh, or if he ever picked up a brush and tried, because, um, you know, you would know. Um, so anyway, this is kind of an interesting artifact, and it's also a really good example of how the collections of, of um, San Francisco Public Library and Letterform Archive complement each other, because they have a rubbing, they have a stone, they have a number of other very special caddish things. Um, we have this... Uh, uh, copy of the book with, with the correspondence between uh, Reynolds and Fairbank. We also have uh, Kaddish's paleography text from his time in, in Rome, which is completely annotated. Um, these are some of the brush letters. This is actually in both collections. This was a special edition of Origin of the Seraph with uh, 50 copies that he wrote the entire brush alphabet by hand, partly to prove that it could be done. Uh, and intentionally with a dry brush so that you could see the ductus and, and what was going on. Um, do you want to say anything about these? Um, these letter forms uh, started in about um, around uh, the time of the death of Julius Caesar, maybe the year after 43 BC, and they went, they were written 
on up into the second century AD, maybe up towards the end, with extreme faithfulness. That, that is the remarkably um, similar letter forms were made by what? Something like 20 generations of craftspeople. Uh, this is one of the longest runs of such things that I know of, maybe the longest. Uh, when you try to do these with a brush, it is very humbling. Uh, there were only a handful of people that I know of who can do a credible job of making these letters with a brush. One of them was here very recently and gave a workshop uh, at the archive through uh, Type of Cooper West. That's John Stevens. And um, it is comforting to see that somebody can do this besides Kadich. <laughs> So these, this work of Kadich um, on the inscription inspired a typeface, and it was a typeface that I um, uh, initiated and oversaw the development of, was designed by Carol Twombly, who did a wonderful job, based very directly on, on the Trajan inscription letters. And this typeface has been um, outrageously successful. It's on and just an, an incredible variety of things now, you know, book jackets, but also dog food and, you know, everything in between. <clears throat> so um, it's been fascinating to watch that proceed. This is, this is the type. So <clears throat> the Trajan inscription and the Imperial Roman letter, the 200 or so years of the Imperial Roman letter are very important because when we come to the Renaissance, uh, I believe that the 15th century is, is an extremely important thing to understand in the history of our letter forms that we are using today. And it's one of the things that I emphasize in teaching this course that we are, have really just begun at the Letter Form Archive, our year-long so-called extended program in typeface design. Because it's the century in which um, printing with movable type in Europe uh, began and the century in which the first Roman typefaces were, were designed and used. The history of how that came about is actually, um, I think, um, still not well enough documented. And the standard issue um, sort of story about it is that it simply was copying the forms that came from humanist manuscripts. This is sort of true, but the humanist manuscripts only started to be written at the beginning of the century. And um, they had a very interesting design problem. And that was that the capitals and the lowercase were united for the first time in the way that we presently use them. Before that, in the Carolingian period, which is what the humanists were copying, the things that we call capitals, the role played by the capitals was, um, <clears throat> was actually filled by uncial letter forms. So at the beginning of a sentence, you would have an uncial letter, and that would be followed by these Carolingian minuscule letters. <clears throat> so, so I only have about 60, 70 years of actually using this alphabet, and, and it definitely changed as the manuscript letters changed over the period uh, of between the beginning of the century and, and on into the first Roman types in the 1460s. And, um, and one of the problems that was faced was how do, you, how do you, if you recognize that these two alphabets are used together as, as a sort of unified whole, how do you make them harmonize? Because they come from two different time periods very far apart they're really two quite different designs in many ways. Um, this is the Ipnerotomachia polyphily. This is um, a publication of Aldus Minucius. Uh, it was first printed in 1499, just barely an incunabulum. And um, this is a, a famous piece of Aldus's typography. It's a very odd piece of literature. Uh, it's written in sort of Italian with some sort of Latinizations and uh, a little Greek thrown in and this and that. And, uh, but it was very popular. Um, 
and uh, it became it, it, it lasted on into the 16th century. It was republished. It was published in France by French printers and so on. So it it, it had a lifetime, and it was translated into English not very long ago. You can get now an English translation with reproductions of these original woodcut illustrations. <laughs> But one of the things that I find fascinating about the, the typography in this book is that in some cases, uh, and back up to this one, those letter forms on the sarcophagus are type. Those are the Roman capital letters that were cut by Francesco Grifo for mm -hmm. all this. And uh, <clears throat> Actually, I should say one more thing about this before we, we go forward. Uh, this this copy of the book is here in in special collections. It's in the Grabhorn collection of the history of printing. It was Robert Grabhorn's copy, but he assembled it from parts. And so you can see here that the two gatherings that are uh, next to each other are different trim sizes because they're from different parts. And I think it's still missing a few leaves, but um, and there's some water damage here and there. But it's it's what he could manage to pull together of the thing. And it's a remarkable artifact, both because it's the Hypnoratomachia, but also because it's Robert Grabhorn's copy. Uh, you can tell, especially on, on the image that you see at the right, the woodcut that you see at the right, that um, some of the capital, and there, there are many, um, <clears throat> There are many illustrations of inscriptions in this book, which is interesting. All sort of fantasy landscapes, many of which contain inscriptions. And um, those letter forms uh, are not type. Those are actually cut in wood and printed with the woodcut. Um, so this is a, an indication of the kind of growing awareness that went on during the Renaissance, during the 15th century, that the Roman capital letters were the original documents of the ancients and that they were very important and they came to assume more and more authority as the century wore on and people got better and better at making them. And um, so, the fact that they they appear in all of these illustrations is just kind of a, gives you some of the flavor of the kind of respect that they gained. And many of these Renaissance scholars went around hunting for inscriptions in order to record, record them. They made these things called siloge, which were catalog. They were the first epigraphists. They made catalogs of these inscriptions and even drawings of them and the way the letter forms actually looked. There's some more you can see on the left. Most, uh, we have Greek. <laughs> and um, that one, um, I, I, I actually think that one is um, probably uh, also carved. Uh, if you look at the A-T-A, K-A-T-A-T, that T-A-T is kerned. Kerning type is a thing that, you know, you can, metal type you really want to try to avoid. And there are many other instances in here where it's not done. So. Yeah. Ah, so this is, um, this is something from the archive. Uh, this is actually something that we now have three copies of, uh, oddly. Um, although two of them are quite damaged and incomplete. They came with the, the uh, Tolinar collection that we acquired last year. So this is the, the Spiegel des Schriftkunst by Jan van der Velde, published in Amsterdam in 1605. Uh, it's an engraved writing book. Um, so van der Velde was the calligrapher who did the, the models. And then an engraver uh, made copper plates, um, of course, in reverse. Uh, and then they were printed by Intaglio um, to produce the book. and. Um, our executive director, Simran, is, is actually an expert in writing books, and she speaks much more eloquently of them than, than I do. But um, she always makes the point that they're an interesting sort of amalgam of calligraphy and printing and publishing. Um, when you think of it, you, you have a writing master 
making a calligraphic model, which is then indirectly printed to teach other people how to write. Um, and by this time of the engraved writing books, this is um, uh, about 100 years after the, the very first writing books, um, they're pretty much show-off pieces. In fact, the largest word on every page in the Van de Velde is Velda. You can see it in the bottom right there. Um, and here are some other example pages. Um, these are spectacular works of calligraphy and engraving and printing. Um, and I find them particularly fascinating because they're still, I, I think they still have contemporary relevance. Some of them have such amazing textures um, and the asymmetry of the layouts is also fascinating. Um, it's always been one of my favorite books and it's, it's a book that we pull out very, very often with visitors because nobody fails to be surprised and delighted by this thing. Um, you know, they can come looking for mid-century modern design and still be blown away by this, or they can come looking for writing books or history of printing or whatever. It's just a fabulous thing. Um, that's a particularly interesting texture. Um, not the most readable. Again, Velda is the largest word right over there. Um, so, um, this one's yours. This is, I'll just set it up. This is, this is from the Tolinar collection and it's in the archive. I think there may also be a copy here at the library. This is the Bodoni Oratio Domenica, which is basically the Lord's Prayer in 160 languages. Um, I want to just mention again that Valerie Lester will be here um, within a short time to give, uh, let's say March 9th, I think, to give her lecture. Uh, she has uh, recently published a uh, uh, book, uh, which is a biography of Bodoni, and um, uh, quite well worth the um, experience she does a very nice job of presenting the material, beautiful images and so on. Um, <clears throat> just a, a, a couple more words about the writing books. The writing books are, are very interesting because the tradition of letter making for books really gets captured by typography. And the typographers, the people who design type, who cut punches to make type, um, really participated in the medieval tradition of not telling what you did because your competitor uh, might learn about it and compete with you, you know. Um, <clears throat> whereas the writing masters had quite a completely different uh, agenda, which was to tell everybody exactly how it was done. Um, <clears throat> and the whole letter-making world sort of splits into two parts uh, as the 16th century goes on and then onward from there which is this whole tradition of writing and teaching writing and publishing these manuals and the designing of typefaces, metal typefaces. And they really come back together uh, only at the end of the 17th century with uh, the Roman du Roi, the, the uh, Roman of the king, uh, which we're not going to talk about in this lecture, but which is a very seminal event in the history of typography and leads up to... I think uh, conceptually leads up to these typefaces, uh, which were made by Giambattista Bodoni. Bodoni uh, was very, very successful in his own time. He had kings and queens coming to the little city of Parma to visit him, um, and he he made very grand volumes. He made an incredible number of typefaces, which were ultimately published in his Manuale Typografico, which was published by his wife uh, and by his widow after his death. Um, <clears throat> we, had, we do have actually copies of, of the Manuale as well. Uh, but this book is one of the last books that he did, uh, and it is a tour de force. It's just uh, outrageous. He, he learned how to cut these punches for non-Latin types because his initial training as a type designer 
was in working for the Propaganda Fides in Rome, the part of the Catholic Church that publishes literature for everybody throughout the world. And of course, they had to use lots of different writing systems. So that's when he got started. So here we have. Um, yeah, I should I should mention the Tolinar collection has about 20 or 25 of the Propaganda Fide uh, booklets, which are um, quite extraordinary and mm. rare, and some and in many cases the uh, the earliest uh, typographic representation of of a language. We think it's a big deal these days, actually, that that we're making non-Latin typefaces now, but. <laughs> Javanese. Um. Some of these are romanizations, um, and some are in the native alphabet. Right. Um. Chinese. Mongolian. Did you zoom in on any of that? Beg your pardon? Did you zoom in on any of that? Um, I don't think so. He wants to zoom in. Yeah, no, oh, it's a okay. PDF. Can't do it. Sorry. This is all. This is the Lord's Prayer. Yeah, it's the Lord's Prayer many times, but no, I, I, it's uh, this one is Cyrillic, for example, and and given the scale of it, um, I I understand it's hard to see the details. Um, you just have to come over to the archive and see the original, uh, or take a class where we have on the wall um, a 4K display that that basically acts like a 40 power microscope. Um, so. Uh, these are some examples of uh, the type foundry ephemera in, in the archive collection. We have now almost 8,000 pieces um, between the combined um, Tolinar and, and my own previous collection. Um, and uh, these are delightful things, and it's, it's rare to find a large aggregation of them. Uh, there are a few places in the world that have it, um, but um, they have... Uh, Basically, the, we're talking about individual brochures, often the first or second uh, release uh, of a typeface. And the foundries, the designers, they put a lot of effort into them. Um, special production, you see things, lots of color, foil stamping. You also tend to see more examples in use than is, than is typical in, in the larger type specimen book. So these are three examples of 20th century revivals of Bodoni that happened to be uh, in the collection. And then a fourth by this guy and team. This is a project that um, uh, began uh, in, uh, I think it actually began in 1990, 90 or 91 and took several years to finish. And that was um, to try to reproduce something of the huge variety of typefaces that Bodoni made. He, if you look through the manual, you see that for every size, he made multiple typefaces. And you read in the introduction to the book that he wanted to have the right, just the right typeface for every book that he published, that he printed. <clears throat> um, so uh, I um, promoted myself to the ITC to, to be the art director for this project. And we already had two designers who had been recruited to work on it. Uh, and we began by going to Parma um, and looking at uh, the, the amazing thing is that you know, a lot of what Bodoni, his, his whole, it's the punches, the matrices, uh, all his books and so on are still there, basically in their original state. So what you can see is quite remarkable. The museum is, uh, is still open. It has a new director and all, uh, you know, you can come to, to Valerie's talk and hear much more about it. But um, what we re decided to do was to make a small size and a large size and then in between sizes. And um, <clears throat> um, 
so we, we it was it was a very interesting process which used uh, uh, in the, the the computer technique of interpolation in which you can have two versions of something and you make in between like if you have a light one and a bold one you can make in between weights or if you have a wide one and a narrow one you can make in between widths and um, <clears throat> so we did that in this project it worked out remarkably well and I think um, I, I, many people have told me that they regard this as the truest um, reproduction of Bodoni's types as uh, as a revival. Um, interestingly enough, the 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 ones that have been influential, and the linotype one has been the most influential in this company, used very very widely for headlines in newspapers for a long time, still is. Um, uh, is really a lot more like uh, a Dido than it is like a Bodoni. And um, so I think, you know, we're, our, our agenda really was to try to recapture some of this feeling of the original Bodoni. Uh, this is a piece that's also in the pop-up exhibit. Um, one of the things that, that uh, we have in the archive is a collection of avant-garde typography from um, the various movements of the early 20th century, like Dada, Futurism, Constructivism, and the Bauhaus. Uh, this piece is by uh, Theo van Dosburg, the Dutch uh, architect and, and uh, designer. Uh, it's called Meccano. It was a, a short-lived periodical. This is issue 4-5, which was actually the last issue of it. Um, as is true of many of the avant-garde periodicals, they're extremely rare. Um, I've been able to find only two others in this country, one at MoMA in New York and one at the Getty. Um, and, uh, and then there's this. And I, I actually, this one, we shot the entire thing. It's not very large, so I'll just run through these uh, to give you a sense of, of what a complete object looks like. Um, one of the interesting things about the data typography is the, the various orientations. And in this piece in particular, there is, um, there's type at 45 degrees, at 90, 180, um, sideways, upside down, um, and a very creative and dynamic use of, of uh, type sizes and ornaments. Um, This center spread is a sounding poem by Kurt Schwitters. Um, uh, Schwitters and Van Dosburg collaborated closely, and um, uh, so it's not a surprise to see Schwitters in Meccano. Um, Van Dosburg collaborated on the first issue of, of uh, Schwitters' periodical called Merits, um, which was the, the Holland data issue. Um, the sounding poetry is really fun, and it's actually a common thread throughout the avant-garde. All of the avant-garde had sounding poetry of one kind or another. There are um, recordings that you can actually get on CD or find on the internet of Schwitters reading his sounding poetry. And there are hoot. I mean, he was, he was um, well, of course, Dada is known for its sense of humor, but Schwitters in particular um, had, I think, quite a remarkable sense of humor. Um, more sideways stuff. And then that's the back cover of the piece. So this is, is 16 pages. It's about, well, it's in the case. It's about maybe uh, eight inches tall. Um, and just an extraordinary piece of experimental typography. Uh, this one is also in the archive. This is, this is a book with a story. Uh, I found this book in uh, a bookstore in Delaware about 40 years ago. And I didn't think much of it at the time. I, I thought, well, I found a wonderful Rudolf Koch book, which I had never seen before. Um, it was his first writing manual. Um, and then a couple years after that, I started working with um, the Neugebauer Press of Austria, and in particular with Michael Neugebauer. Um, and what I had not realized is that this was his father's copy. Now. Friedrich Neugebauer is a famous calligrapher, and in fact, uh, the, one of the first things I did with Michael was distribute his father's calligraphy book in the US. Um, I knew Friedrich's work, but I didn't think Fritz was the same as Friedrich. Um, so one time Michael came over and uh, I showed him this book and he said, wait, 
that's my father's nickname. This was my father's book. So the following year, I went to Bad Goizern to visit Friedrich, and uh, he confirmed that indeed it was his book. And not only was it his book, but he bound it and hand lettered the cover. Um, if you look into the history of this book, it was never actually published in hardcover, only in wrappers. So uh, this is a unique copy. Uh, and then I think you wanted to say something about Koch. Koch was um, a remarkable uh, person uh, a, in many ways, some played somewhat similar role in Germany to the role that Edward Johnson played in England in reviving calligraphy and um, teaching it. Uh, he, um, he was not only a calligrapher, he also was a printer. He cut punches, he designed typefaces. He, like Edward Johnson, who also designed typefaces, he um, uh, had a workshop. He was um, uh, very active um, uh, in the sort of German version of the arts and crafts movement. He was very fond uh, of um, um, William Morris and, and the English arts and crafts movement. In fact, uh, uh, apparently he was known to say that he really couldn't believe that William Morris wasn't a German. <laughs> um, so this book, I think, is quite wonderful. It, it shows you, um, and, and his black letter typefaces are, are, to me, I think, in many ways, the most appealing of all the black letter work that I have ever seen. They just have a certain kind of liveliness to them that uh, is remarkable. And here you see these small variations on the letter forms, which is a kind of a thing that he, uh, you know, has in his work that really gives it a certain kind of liveliness that you don't normally see. You used to seeing black letter typefaces that look like picket fences, but Cox don't look like that. They they. Well, he very, also cut his own punches. He cut his own punches. So um, <clears throat> so here is a, is is a, is a manual which is showing you these little small variations. I'm, all of you who are in my class should take note of this. <laughs> some of his formal pieces. Uh, this is another uh, avant-garde piece. This is, this is uh, a surrealist piece. Uh, the cover is by Marcel Duchamp. Um, the, the title translates as the seventh face of the die. Um, and in fact, um, the text and the illustrations are equally inscrutable. Um, rather wild uh, typography here. The, so it's only the cover that's by Duchamp. The, the layout of the interior pages is by the author, Georges Hunier, who was, um, uh, as you'll see, quite an experimental typographer and, and one of the uh, better known surrealists. Um, so these, these spreads combine typographic collage with photo montage. Um, it's quite erotic, both in subject matter and uh, imagery, um, and it's it's one of the seminal pieces of surrealist typography. And there's also, I think, a pretty clear sense of humor in this work. Okay, Zopf. So from lascivious to luscious, <laughs> I guess. Hermann Zoff recently passed away. Um, there has been a great deal of um, coverage in the various levels of the media about this. I'm, I'm very, it's, it's wonderful to see that. And um, uh, the outpouring of, of respect and, and the sort of, uh, accounting of personal tales about how influential Zopf was in people's lives have been very fascinating to read. And uh, I think, you know, we just wanted to um, again pay homage to him and show a couple of these extraordinary pieces that are here in the library uh, from a publication that he did 
uh, which was engraved by uh, the man who also cut punches for his types, August Rosenberger. Uh, and this is a, a book called Feder und Stichel in German, um, pen engraver in English. And this is the plate and the uh, print. Um, I, I have always thought that Zaff's, um, that the, the typefaces that Rosenberg cut for Stempel um, were, had that extra something that when Linotype got a hold of them and made them for the Linotype machine, somehow evaporated. It's almost like the difference between seeing things on the screen and seeing things uh, on paper in the flesh. So um, <clears throat> it, it's it's wonderful to see these things. You can look at them. They're, They're right in, the, in case. the case back here. And uh, marvelous work. Uh, this is something that, that um, I chose from the library's collection to talk about because I've always been a fan of, of this guy's work and we have very little of it. Um, uh, so these, these uh, there are two or three books here that I'll run through pretty quickly. They're by Hans Schmidt, who was a German calligrapher and book designer and book uh, artist. Um, they're in very small editions, typically about 20 copies. And um, I, I just want to say that it's, it's a tribute to um, the curator emeritus of the Harrison Collection, who's here tonight, Susie Taylor, um, this is one of many examples of her good taste in bringing some amazing contemporary work to this collection. Um, and um, I've been looking for them for years and we can't find them, so you just have to come here to see them. Um, so this one is from, I think, 1984. Um, I don't know German, so I can't tell you what they're about. This, this is woodcut, um, as is much of his work. Um, this is another one from, from 1986. Um, and not only are the letter forms amazing, but the way that he uses them across and between and around the spreads is quite delightful. Um, this is yet another one called Novalis from 1987. And this one is on a Japanese tissue and as you can see on the, okay, so this is the title spread. That is on the, on the recto, the right reading version of the title page. Uh, the tissue is quite transparent. So when you turn the page, that's what you get. You get the reverse of the title page and the beginning of the text, which is actually fading through the tissue letter by letter. Um, so this is what it's like to turn the pages. Okay, that's Schmidt. Um, some more lascivious for Sumner to Back talk to about. Lascivious, yeah. <clears throat> so this is um, a project done by a Dutch designer named Anton Beek. Um, he, um, he did this originally in uh, 1969. Um, it's, um, and, and, he, and he published a, a book with these photographs and uh, he called it Beautiful Girls. And I'm not gonna comment too much on the um, sort of political issues that it involves, but um, the one thing that I really was drawn to about these things was the fact that he actually made quite good letter forms. <laughs> and you know, this is a tradition of using bodies to make letters that goes way back. It goes back to the 15th century. There are many, many examples of it. Sometimes the bodies are clothed, sometimes they're not, and they do other things as well. And um, <clears throat> you know, it's a very interesting thing. You can, you can Google you know, uh, body letters and see uh, what you get. Um, as images, they're, they're very interesting. This um, color version of the book was published in 2011, and it contains now um, uh, these figures, as we call them in typography. Uh, this is this is a piece from the archive. This is a, a single. Um, it's actually a collage by the Czech um, uh, 
artist, concrete poet, Jiri Kolar. Um, and um, he has a little bit of surrealism in him, but he did virtually everything that he did involved text in one way or another. I think you can, yeah, you can see pretty clearly that the collage is, is made up of text. Um, and he just had an amazing way of abstracting text into textures and form. Um, he wrapped these collages around sculpture. He um, did, you know, original collages and prints like this. Uh, he also did typewriter art and, and concrete poetry uh, and had a long um, career as, as uh, an artist and concrete poet. Um, so uh, he's always been one of my favorites. This is, this is the only uh, original piece in the archive, but we have a lot of secondary material on him. Um, this is, um, a, again, a tribute to Susie. Uh, this is a, an envelope addressed to Susie here at the library by Georgia Deaver. Um, and Georgia is uh, a San Francisco calligrapher that, that um, um, passed away a couple years ago, sadly, quite young. Um, but her work was just amazing, and um, her archive is here in the library. Um, I had a personal connection to her, um, which is that in the 80s, um, she did work for uh, Neugebauer Press, which was our sister company, and for uh, Alphabet Press. This was from a series of greeting cards that we did in the US. Um, and it's funny because we were in the library and Sumner was actually picking out George's work and he said, oh, we have to shoot this one. I said, well, I published that. Um, so anyway, you, you wanted to talk about Georgia. Well, uh, Georgia um, was uh, remarkably uh, prolific. She worked on a great deal of great variety of commercial work. Um, she clearly liked to doing book jackets. Um, I read an interview with her just yesterday in which she talks about that. And But she also did, you know, wine labels. She did packaging. She did, I don't know, a huge variety of kinds of commercial work. And she did personal work as well, um, which you see a, a bit of here. So... You know, she had a kind of um, a freedom in her writing, which um, I think probably um, is unsurpassed. <laughs> quite, quite remarkable. And um, I know that um, that when I'm sure that when she she uh, applied to be a member of the Society of Scribes and Illuminators, and I have a feeling that. Um, this might have upset them because none of them can do anything even close to this. <laughs> this is true. Uh, I just want to point out this piece is in the case in back as well. Um, and there's another piece of hers that's slightly lascivious. And then the last um, artist that we're going to feature is is um, Tom Ingmeyer, Thomas Ingmeyer. Um, he is another San Francisco calligrapher, um, still alive and kicking and, and doing amazing work. And in fact, uh, he has an exhibit up currently at the Book Club of California. Um, he also has a piece in, in our show at the San Francisco Center for the Book. Um, these pieces are from a collection of broadsides of his that are in the archive. Um, the library also has a wonderful collection of his original works, uh, manuscript books, and, and other things. Um, and these were done as a kind of a series. They were done um, in mostly in 2013 and mostly with Octavio Paz texts. I think they're, well, the one on the right is Paz. Um, He has such a wonderful sense of dynamic balance, and um, and he's also, especially in recent years, gotten incredibly creative with his letter forms. Um, some of it is quite abstract. Um, usually, there's a text of one kind or another underlying it, but um, yeah. And 
And there we are. Thank you.